This morning, I had the pleasure of speaking to the Michigan chapter of the American Medical <laughs> Students Association in, in this afternoon, the privilege of speaking to MSMS. So it's a delight, it's great to be here. Uh, my style is generally informal, so questions, comments, critiques all the way through are welcome. Uh, so it's not bad enough that I have to follow Susan Gould. Can you throw on this trailer <laughs> to make me look even worse? Well, oddly enough, oddly enough, I hope that what I have to say today will end up really reinforcing what we just saw in the trailer. We'll see. It may not work, but, but I hope that it's actually very consistent. Uh, Andy, so the, the topic uh, uh, of the symposium is the erosion of the physician-patient relationship. I prefer to use the term the evolution of the physician-patient relationship. So I'm, I'm actually not going to be talking at all about the erosion, rather how I view the changes. As um, as a scholar, I would certainly not think that the, the, the title of is the uh, physician-patient relationship going to sur uh, survive uh, correct. I, I think it, it certainly will survive, but it, it will survive in different forms and, and different ways of, of providing care than we perhaps see today. As a patient, I certainly hope it survives, because I need you a lot more than you need me. <laughs> and we'll continue to. So I, I have a stake in this as both a, a faculty member and, and a patient. So I want to talk, um, uh, frame this in terms of perhaps the balance between a physician's obligation to his or her patients and society's need for information or desire for information. Now, how do we think about that tension, which, which is inherent in, in the relationship? And the context, again, is the, this evolving nature of, of the physician-patient relationship. Um, one may well characterize it as eroding, um, but I, again, I'm not going to. Nonetheless, the, the broader context is dramatic environmental change, change in the structure of healthcare that, that you see on a day-to-day -day basis. And I certainly talked to, although I was talking largely about healthcare reform to the students, but that was also about the future. And for, for the students, for young physicians, their world will be uh, perhaps radically different from the world you grew up in. Uh, there's always been a tension between your legal and ethical obligations. What I want to postulate is that you, that physicians in uh, over the next 10 to 20 years will face no less daunting ethical and legal challenges, but I'm not sure there'll be any more daunting than you've endured over the last 20, 30 years. They'll change, they'll be different, but I'm not sure they're going to get worse uh, that may not be of much comfort, because you may think that certainly the legal system has intruded too much already in the physician-patient relationship or has provided inadequate guidance and, and that the ethical responsibilities are, 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 are wrong. I, I think, to the contrary, that we've seen over oh, the last 10, 15 years a blurring of the legal and ethical responsibilities. And I, I, I want to give an example of that in a few minutes. So where are we? Am I doing this right? I'm really having trouble. All right. This thing is not working. Ah. At the monitor. Well, okay. So, all right. So we know there are a lot of changes in in the healthcare environment. You see them every day. Now, changes in, re in reimbursement. I'll come back to this. Changes in the structure, how we deliver care, uh, the Affordable Care Act with the Accountable Care Organizations. 
uh, may or may not affect those of you my age, but will certainly affect those uh, newly minted graduates and whether they're able to have small or solo practices, probably not. Whether they become employees of larger health systems or they form their own large physician groups and contract to form accountable care organizations. The world will look different regardless of whether the Affordable Care Act survives. The changes that I want to talk about here are, are secular. You are changing how medicine is provided, sometimes under pressure, financial and, and other, but sometimes because it, there, it may be uh, more efficient, higher quality care. That's a debatable statement, but we'll leave it at that. Where I'm headed, and that's consistent, I think, with the trailer just shown, is the integration of population health, public health, and clinical medicine. And I think that may be where I see the nature of the physician-patient relationship changing, where the responsibility is over a 10 to 15 year period will be as much about um, improving the health of communities as it is about improving the health of your patients or, and or patient panels. So in, in a sense, that's, that forms the broader issue of your obligations to me as a patient and your obligations to society, whatever, however we may define them. It, I, I think implicit in what I've said so far is that I've never seen the physician-patient relationship as static. I think it's changed over the last X number of years, I suspect. Well, for how many ever years you've been in practice, you've seen differences, whether the differences are in, in the amount of time you have to spend with the patient, the where you provide the care to the patient, or any other, number of other dimensions. It's probably not the same as it was, and certainly won't be the same. There are new reporting requirements. You have HIPAA obligations. I'm sure no one wants to talk about HIPAA. I don't either, so I'm just going to mention it and move on. We could talk about the onerous regulations, the regulatory burden that's only gotten worse and, and, and it needs to be rethought from the ground up. Going forward, how will social media affect your interaction with patients for good, for perhaps less good, uh, remains to be seen. Uh, the consolidation of healthcare that I just mentioned will influence the physician-patient relationship. It will change my encounter with you in, in any number of ways. And that doesn't begin to talk about um, the role of uh, genetics, personalized medicine, and, and, and Len may have more to say about that sitting there, and, and uh, that'd be fine too. Uh, I'll get back to say a few things about it. Uh, and, this, and, and, and one other point, scope of practice laws. So we may see dramatic changes in how primary care is practiced, where we, we in, in some senses, transfer much of the primary care responsibility to nurse practitioners, physician assistants. If so, we need to create a new role for primary care physicians. And I don't know exactly what that new role will be. I wrote a commentary with one of my students in the Journal of General Internal, or Internal Medicine to try to lay out some ra a rationale for a new role and to suggest some directions it might take. But I think that would have to come from the profession. And that, that too changes. If, if your role is to monitor more broadly primary care, how much contact do you have with me as a patient? In that sense, one might talk about erosion in, 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 in a different way than I have. So we start, and in here, I'm really, um, as you know, Ed Goldman was scheduled to make the presentation, and, and he was unable to be here, so I gladly substituted for him. And, and one of the ways he thought of framing this, and I agree with him, is in the changing nature of privacy and confidentiality as, as essentially a, a um, uh, um, a, a way of thinking about 
the changes in the patient-physician relationship. When we start, I don't know, we start with, with the classic I, from the Geneva Declaration modified in, in 2006, I will respect the secrets that are caught, confided in me even after the patient has died. So we have to make a distinction between privacy and confidentiality. Privacy generally thought of as my right to determine what information will be known about me, period. So you may recommend a PSA test, and I may say, no thank you, been there, done that, I'm done, doesn't work, I read all the recommendations, I don't want it. And that's it. You can't, that's it. It's my right to control my body, classic right to privacy. Or I may say, okay, I'll do it, go ahead. But then what happens to the information? That's where the physician-patient confidentiality comes in. I have a right to have that information remain confidential. But the law and sometimes ethics will collide with this. And the law will then say, no, you have to disclose certain information. So it's a limitation, but it's not an unalloyed limitation. There, there are instances where society's right to know outweighs my right to uh, claim the uh, privilege of confidentiality. So, for example, in the, co the, in the classic that you have to deal with is the, Tar the Tarasov situation where the conflict between the physician-patient privilege and, and society's right to know is really raw. That is, I tell you that I intend to kill Andy because I never liked him. That's all. I just never liked him. I don't care what anybody else does. I know he's well-liked. I don't. I'm going to kill him. Your obligation is to warn that identifiable third party. But suppose I tell you, oh, I'm your basic misanthrope. I never liked people. I got bullied as a kid. I'm really, the rage, the rage, I can't control it. I think I'm going to shoot up a movie theater. Do you have an obligation to disclose? You do. Who are you telling? There's no identifiable third person. Aren't you violating your, my uh, privilege of exercising the physician-patient confidential confidentiality? So the law doesn't, the law has said so far, in Michigan it's codified that you have immunity if you report in good faith. Okay, so even if, even if you're wrong, let's say you don't have an obligation to disclose us, I haven't named an identifiable third party, although one could argue I've named an identifiable place and placed uh, the community at risk of harm, so far the law hasn't gone there. But we'll get to another uh, issue on, on seizure dis disorders where I, I want to have that same dialogue. Um, even if you're wrong, that you don't have a duty to, if you're acting in good faith, you have immunity. You're not going to, you can't be sued, you can't lose your license. But if I name someone, then you have an obligation to breach that confidential relationship. So the law here tries to reach a balance between uh, the, the need for confidentiality but the simultaneous need to protect society. And it can be waived. I can waive my right to your disclosure. Or if you take a test and, I, and it comes back that I have a, a contagious disease, then you must report. So if I have uh, tuberculosis, there are, there are reporting requirements. If I have HIV, there are reporting requirements because there's an immediate harm to third persons. Um, so the, the classic Michigan law says a medical protect, practitioner should not disclose information learned while treating a patient. And there are exceptions, in this case after the patient has died, uh, reporting violence to the police, although I'm not sure what that means, for reasonably foreseeable risk of HIV transmission, and the threat of physical violence to a reasonably identifiable third person. So there is a reasonably identifiable if I say I'm going to shoot it up. Maybe. 
maybe. But there are mandated disclosures. Uh, 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 abortion in Michigan, breast cancer, HIV testing, medical marijuana, reduced life expectancy. I have no idea what that means or why you would have to report reduced life expectancy. Uh, and experimental procedures, uh, sort of, and, and the disclosure to others, child welfare, child abuse, and neglect. Now even here, we have all sorts of dilemmas that you have to face. Suppose I come, my, my wife comes in um, uh, and you, you suspect fetal alcohol syndrome. In some states, that's a specific um, indicator of child abuse. But in most, the law is very general. So do you report? Do you detect? Do you have policies to detect and report? That's a very sensitive issue. If she comes in with um, you know, obvious cocaine use and the, the baby is born with the, the symptoms of drug addiction, do you report? Then generally, yes. Generally, that, that is, is included within the definition. But there, there, these are arguable, depending on the specificity of the law, infectious disease, STD is pretty clear. Okay, the, some of these disclosures are really to the patient, where Michigan law seems to have this sense of um, informed choice, that the goal is to inform the patient and that, that fulfills your obligation to society, which makes some sense if you think about it. If, I'm, if, the, if, the, if third parties aren't directly affected or you don't know that they're affected, it doesn't make sense to, to impose a duty, either ethically or legally, on you to disclose beyond warning me as a, as a patient. Uh, I think what, what the law is driving at here is that conversation between the physician and the patient over my value. So again, using the PSA, since nobody knows what the right treatment is, no offense to any urologists in the crowd, but, but we really don't know whether I should have radiation or prostatectomy or watchful waiting very well. So a lot depends on my values, and the whole purpose of the law here is to stimulate that discussion more than placing any, any further burdens on you. But the, here we start to get into some of the challenges. What about family members and genetic testing? Uh, suppose you, uh, I agree to the test and it turns out I have an incurable disease that's inherited. And you say, I think you ought to tell your sister. And I say, I don't like my sister. You're getting a pattern here, I don't like people. So, <laughs> so I don't like my sister. I haven't talked to my sister in 30 years. You want to tell her? You tell her. She wants to get tested, she'll get tested. Why are you asking me to do this? You do it. Well, is that right? Is that a burden that we ought to put on? Are you ethically obligated to disclose? Are you legally obligated to make that disclosure? And more broadly, what about the mental health? So um, suppose you treat my daughter and, and she has uh, anorexia. She's, let's say, 15, 16. Do you tell me? Do you call in the parent? Do you tell her to get your parents in here? Are you legally obligated to, to do that? Are you ethically obligated? Suppose it's a sexually transmitted disease. And she tells you, my father will kill me if he knows that I've been sexually active. Ethically, legally, tough balance, tough calls. In, in, in some ways, I, I might argue that the law certainly doesn't guide, give you a whole lot of guidance on these issues. And, and in that sense, it really is an ethical decision. How do you weigh the potential that my daughter sues you for breaching physician-patient confidentiality with the need to have the parents involved in treating anorexia? 
and the fear that if, I, if she has, has gotten pregnant or has sexually transmitted disease, she'll be treated poorly, perhaps, and even abused. Um, and, and what's your responsibility there? So let's look at an e epilepsy as a case study on, on these conflicts. Suppose you have a patient who has a seizure disorder causing blackouts and loss of control. And, and apparently this inconsistent, it may be non-compliant, or you have reason to believe that the patient is non-compliant. Do you have an obligation to disclose? Are you allowed to disclose? Should you disclose? Do you have a legal obligation? Do you have an ethical obligation? What do you think? Any takers on this? What are you worried about? So suppose I'm your patient, I'm non-compliant, I have a seizure disorder. Suppose I'm a school bus driver. Isn't there some way, for school bus drivers, isn't there some way they screen those epileptics out or something? I didn't get screened out. I fooled them. Just like I fooled students for many years. Now, I mean, you, let's assume I'm... I didn't get screened out. Should have, but I didn't. Do you have a driver's license? Yes. I do. What are you thinking anyway about this whole thing? What are you thinking? You don't like kids either? <laughs> no, not particularly. <laughs> <laughs> to whom? Okay. Ethically, legally? Ethically, good. Well, I think there's an ethical reason to do that, but I think there's also, it's also possible to legally and ethically disclose to the uh, licensing bureau if you're the physician caring for the patient. Okay. If you feel that the patient is impaired to drive. Yes. Yes, regardless, suppose I'm not a school driver, so a school bus driver. Suppose I'm just an ordinary person, a patient of yours, have a seizure disorder, and um, you know I'm non-compliant, but I'm still driving. Does that change your response? Then who do you respond, who do you, yeah, or maybe police? Yeah, ethically. But are you violating my confidential, patient confidentiality? You're disclosing facts about me that are normally protected under the physician-patient confidentiality. You are, are you breaching confidentiality? You have an ethical obligation to do that. I, I agree with you. I, I definitely think, but I, I, I do think the, the, it's not clear to me that you would have the same immunity that you have for other disclosures if you do it. Here I would argue mm -hmm. yep. How, who won? I'm not. I'm not surprised. I don't think that's a great result. I think, he, but but if you if you read the law and and uh, around confidentiality, that's the result I would predict generally because it is a breach of confidentiality. Note the analogy to Tarasov. What does Tarasov say? An identifiable third person. So one could make the same argument on a bus driver, because you know you identify the kids as being at risk. Therefore, under the language of the Michigan statute that talks about reasonableness, I think you might win. So a lot depends on how the Florida statute is written. Nonetheless, nonetheless, do you think, even if that case is the law, do you disclose? Sorry, I interrupted you. No, I, well, I was thinking you, you probably do. What, what's your um, legal risk if you know somebody is at risk to drive, say a school bus driver, and the bus 
crashes. And then they know that you're taking care of that person and they get your medical records and says, right. Right. Well, and, and to that point, what we're, isn't that what we're seeing out of the um, Colorado massacre? Holmes, wasn't that the guy's name? Holmes, he shot up the theater. His psychiatrist is probably uh, likely to be sued for failure to identify. I mean, I, so, so here, I, it, it seems to me that the ethical obligation outweighs generally. But but even even if you may be sued, you do have a risk if you do nothing. So you may get caught there and then. Yeah. What if you feel that you should inform the patient that ah, you're going to great. report to the various authorities? Excellent point. I'll get to that in a second. What's the what's the cutoff? Or they they know that you tell they tell you that they're texting while they're driving the bus to every day. At what point do you use this? Okay, great points, great points. Uh, uh, texting is one that terrifies me. By the way, um, I I teach in, in this 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 term I'm teaching a course on public health policy to first year master's students, and. Uh, in, in the first or second, uh, first class, we started talking about texting and other things, uh, and the New York limits on on soda, big soda. And so, in the second class, I said, I asked for a show of hands, how many of you text while driving? In a class of 80, 88, about half the hands went up. I was stunned. And these are. These, about a, th a third of them are right out of college, but two thirds have had at least one year of work experience. Do you know of any state that has a statute that when you apply for a driver's license and it's given to you, you have waived your right to confidentiality? No. I don't know of any such state. The, generally, the waiver of confidentiality is on a case-by-case -case basis rather than a blanket waiver. So the broad point is the law is inconsistent, generally. That, that pervades health law. There are lots of inconsist inconsistencies in regulations relative to the policies that the regulations are designed to achieve. Second point is, even under HIPAA, the exceptions are for payment, treatment, and operations. So information can be disclosed, uh, the, the minimal, minimally necessary information, for payment purposes. So, you, so HIPAA doesn't protect you there. Third point is that the insurer, the, there's, the insurer cannot disclose that information to anyone else. It's only for the purposes of payment. So the problem, the obvious problem is I'm being treated, let's say, for bipolar disease. And you have to report that. The insurer notifies, let's say, um, inadvertently, my employer. And the University of Michigan says, um, we didn't like you anyway, and now that you're bipolar, you're out. So I've been harmed by that disclosure. You're protected because you're required to report it, but the, I can sue the insurer for a breach of privacy. The, the insurer has to, to make sure that it has systems in place so that that information is not disclosed to a third party. Where the, where, where the problem comes in is that all employers have, have, have systems in place to monitor their expenses. So all the employer should know is that X employee was treated for bipolar disease 
or why employee has HIV. Should never the employer because the employer has a right to monitor the costs. And particularly this this came up during in the beginning of the managed care era, where where we started to have these kinds of of, of procedures and more data available. And 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 so the employer can monitor the health care costs, but should not be able to do so on an individual basis. Where that starts to break down moving forward is on prevention and wellness, where employers are developing incentives and, and potentially sanctions if I don't participate. Suppose I'm morbidly obese, or let's say I'm, I'm just obese, uh, maybe a BMI of, what, 31, 30, uh, right on, okay? So, and, and you're, you employ, you're my employer, so you want to put in place an incentive for me to attend a personal fitness, change diet, everything that you would want for someone who's obese, short of gastric bypass surgery. And, and that may be necessary done at, at some point, but not, not initially. Well, suppose I don't go. Can you use that information to raise my health insurance premiums? We do that for tobacco, after all. If I'm a smoker, I pay more. So if I'm obese and I'm not following some type of treatment, should I pay more? Or does it put my employment at risk if I fail to adhere to reasonable expectations of improving my health? Where is the boundary? So getting back to the questions that you guys raised on texting and basically the slippery slope of the, the uh, uh, seizure disorder, in, 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 whoops, I went too far. In Michigan, there's no requirement that you disclose the seizure disorder. And in fact, in the case of Duval v. Golden, the court, Michigan Court of Appeals in 1984 ruled that it's foreseeable that a physician's failure to diagnose or properly treat an epileptic condition may create a risk of harm to a third party, particularly, again, seizure disorder while I'm driving. But physicians have no duty to disclose. The court said, you're not a highway accident insurer. The responsibility is the patients, which gets to your point about warning the patient. So the Michigan law right now is your duty is to warn the patient. But let's fast forward to a recent case in Massachusetts. So we're talking now about the evolution rather than the erosion of the physician-patient relationship. So my, my feeling that it evolves, and the law evolves. In Massachusetts, a third person was injured after the physician failed to warn the patient not to drive, given the medication's side effects. Now, the normal law would be you don't have a duty to disclose, and even if you have a duty to warn the patient, it's only the patient who could sue you. So you fail to warn me. In fact, th this sort of happened. I was in Big Rapids on, on project interviews and came down with, a, with what I thought was a fairly garden variety prostatitis. They're not fun, but it's no big deal. I, I got the antibiotic, physician called it in, I got it, and I just kept getting worse. So I ended up going to the emergency department and they finally discharged me and said, we think it's kidney stones. and gave me a shot of Toradol and no warning not to drive. Well, I was in pretty bad shape and didn't use very good judgment and tried to drive. I could have been killed, but worse, I could have killed someone else. It would have been much worse. And the, I, clearly the hospital failed in its duty to warn that I shouldn't be driving. I'm here, nobody got hurt. Suppose I had, I had been in an accident and, and, and harmed someone. Under 
traditional Michigan law, I could have sued the hospital for failure to warn, but the person I hurt could not. That person could sue me, but could not sue the hospital for lots of legal reasons I don't think we need to go into. The Massachusetts court ruled that the physician owed a duty to, quote, all those put at risk by his failure to warn, and then, and then offered a few legal and policy rationales. The dissent, a vigorous dissent, opposed the extension of tort liability beyond the duty to the individual patient. So there's nothing preventing the Michigan court from uh, basically rejecting the precedent, the 1984 precedent, and citing the Massachusetts case, which, which would then extend the disclosure. To your question, I don't know the answer whether if someone comes in with a, having uh, knowingly drinking a fifth of bourbon every day or texting while driving should be disclosed. The law of informed consent it, it, it has a very clear structure that I'm sure you're very familiar with, but at the margin, at these kinds of extensions, isn't at all clear. I, 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 so the question gets back to, is, is it a legal obligation or is it the same? If, if you're willing to say, I have an ethical obligation, as you did, to disclose the, the seizure disorder, what's different about the example of drinking or texting? Law works by analogy. It works a lot by narrative, but a lot by analogy. So, the, so if I'm a, a judge or if I'm an attorney defending you, I want to make the right analogy. And so is, is drinking like the seizure disorder? Is texting like the seizure disorder? As a policy type, I want to argue that it is. But does that do what the Michigan court said they didn't want to do? Make you a highway accident insurer. And I think that's the essence of this duty that, the, and this framing, the privacy confidentiality relative to what society wants to know. And, and I think we have to be very careful about imposing such ethical and, and or legal responsibilities to make your job impossible. And that's the tough balance I think a court would face. So do I have to disclose that I had a fight with my wife this morning? Or that my children are driving me nuts? Of course, why is this day different from any other day? <laughs> Sir? Compared driving and distracted driving. Two different things. Two different things. They are different, but what's the analogy? The, you're a physician. I come in to you and I say, I text all the time. And, it, and what's different about it than a seizure disorder? I think, huh? One is voluntary, that's right. And one is involuntary. Why are you responsible? Why are you morally, ethically responsible for the involuntary than the voluntary? Well, one is you have a role in treating the, the, the involuntary. And I think that may be the distinction. But suppose, suppose I'm an addiction counselor and you're coming to me for addiction medicine. So I am treating you. I'm not treating you for distracted driving. That just comes up when, you, when you're taking a history and physical. So the distinction we may want to draw is, are you treating me for a particular disease or condition? If you are, then maybe that's where the duty, the ethical duty attaches. But you can't be held responsible for everything I tell you to disclose. Yeah. Like to more 
That's, that's right. Well, that. Well, you want to defend, well, I disclosed, nothing bad happened, but I was trying to restore right. the greater right. that right. didn't. Right. But the, the risk there, yeah, the risk is you get, you get sued for the breach of confidentiality, but you lose my trust. That's, that's the problem. I have, I, uh, why are you breaching confidentiality to tell someone that I text? What can they do about it? Why is that relevant? Why are you telling my, my employer that I, I drink a little bit? Now I'm fired and I can't afford you anyway because I have no insurance. But even, even if I retain my insurance on a COBRA plan or something else, I still now can't trust you. And that's, that's, that's where clearly you're talking about erosion. There's nothing worse than not being able to trust what you, what you do, that, inter, that interaction. So, I, I mean, on, when in doubt, I guess you disclose. But I think I would make the kinds of distinctions that where you're treating someone and, and you know that the patient is non-compliant, and that non-compliance exposes people to the risk of harm, at a minimum, you must warn the patient. But if, if it's a school bus driver, are you willing to put at risk lots of kids relative to losing a patient? The first is a Florida case from 1995 where the patient was not warned about a genetically inheritable disease, um, um, medullary thyroid carcinoma. And the court said the duty runs to the children who must be warned. And in this case, the failure to warn the patient put the children at risk. But that's a failure to warn the patient, okay? That's not the, the, the essential concern in your question, right? Your concern is a failure to warn a third party who's, a, who's very much uh, affected by the decision to disclose it. And it is, by the way, it, it is the classic way of framing the tension between disclosure and confidentiality. Absolutely. So the second case is in 1996, which is a little different because here the court, so in the first case, the court only addresses to the warn the patient, and in, in which case the physician would have no duty to warn the third, third person, the, 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 the fiancé in your hypothetical. But in, in Safer versus uh, Pack, the, the father, who was the patient, wasn't warned about another genetically inheritable disease, multiple polyposis, and the court said that the duty runs to the children who must be warned, and the court made a specific analogy to infectious diseases. So that under, we have partner notification for HIV. Now, it's not your responsibility, but here the court said because it's heritable, because the physician knew or should have known that the children would be placed at risk of it in inheriting this disease, that the physician should have made an effort to locate the children. The problem with that is fairly obvious. What does it mean to make an effort to locate the children? The children could be thousands of miles away. Do you put a note on Facebook? You put, send an email, call home. I mean, what's reasonable? And it's not as though you don't have other things to do. So that, in, in, but in your case, you would know, the physician would, would know, would have access to make a phone call to the fiance. I refuse. And you refuse. Are you ethically or legally responsible? So the third case, doesn't really help us either, and it's a 2004 Minnesota case where the, the physician, it, it, it's a very confusing case because it dealt with 
misplacing records and failure to transfer records, et cetera, et cetera. But the uh, parents weren't warned about the heritability and future risks of a child born with fragile X syndrome. So they went ahead, they, they, so they, the physician ordered a test to, to determine whether the first child had fragile X, and it was never carried out. The test was never conducted. So the patient didn't know for certain what the problem was with the first child, went ahead and had a second child who was born also with fragile X, then sued the, all of the physicians because the parents argued they would not have conceived the second child. Well, the, and, and the court s s held the physician liable for not. None of these cases answers your question. And there's not much more guidance than that. Um, I, I think we're back to making the argument whether ethically you think you have a, a, an obligation to breach confidentiality. At a minimum, you have an obligation to warn the patient. But the, the law has not yet mandated that you have a, a, a legal obligation to warn the third person because even if, you, even if you were to adopt the Tarasov rationale, there's an identifiable third person. Who is at risk? It's really the unborn. The child has not been conceived. It is the one at risk. So you haven't, I mean, how far is the law going to take this out? What I think is the future of, of the physician-patient relationship in, in terms of its evolution is there will be more teams. You'll we'll be working in teams more than ever before. You'll have more remote consultations. I mean, this, this little thing here, you'll ask me to take a picture and I'll send it to you and then you'll diagnose it. You may not have me come in at all. So your generation will have, this will be, this will be a, a, a relic by the time you guys are in, in, in the middle of your career. You'll sell it as an antique. But for now, I can get all of my records. So if I show up on your doorstep and you've never seen me before, you can go in and I can get to myuofm.org and it's got everything you want. You need to know about me. That will change the interaction. At the same time, you've already seen this, I can go online and I'm barraging you with, have you seen this study and that study? And that does change the nature of the interaction. It challenges your authority in a way that never would have happened beforehand. You have to deal with, with crazy people like me who go on and think they know what they're talking about. I know better than that, actually. <laughs> I'm actually a very good patient, believe it or not. Um, I, 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 I'm old enough, old enough to have great respect for your knowledge. Think about health care the secular forces driving healthcare delivery, that you'll be more in the business of wellness and prevention. The focus will be on community health, on assessing the needs of the community and w fitting my needs into that. It'll be an integration rather than a distinct physician-patient relationship here, community here. They'll be much more integrated. I don't think it changes the nature of the ethical obligations or the legal obligations, it changes how we apply them. So I, I don't, I, so let me just conclude with saying that yeah, it will change. And maybe we'll need new frameworks. It's a dynamic relationship and, and maybe that's good. Maybe that's good that it won't be that Mike Rosenblum came to my house when I was a kid. But it may be something equally good. The technology may be, um, improve your ability to keep me healthy. And the legal, for the most part, the ethical and legal sh uh, obligations will shift accordingly. My feeling is that it's the physicians who ought to take the lead in defining and suggesting the solutions. Because you've got the experience, the credibility, the knowledge 
to make these tough calls, to help solve that, that even that simple problem of is it different from a seizure disorder to texting to drinking. Your insight should help drive how we think about the ethics and the law. Thanks a lot.